Okay. Listen, I have big news, actually. I've been waiting to share this with Katie for a couple days. So I have a chair update. Oh, great. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the way you couldn't have been less excited just now. Like, <laughs> this has just she been a, such it. a saga, you know? Oh, she already she told, told you about, about it. it before. Well, she told me about it before she came on. She was like, I had the Allen wrench. I did. I had like, oh, don't spoil it for her. (laughs) I didn't. I only gave him the Allen wrench. I didn't even show him. Oh, okay. Well, give us the big old chair update. Okay. (laughs) That we're all dying for. (laughs) I took this chair off the side of the road during the pandemic. It was in someone's garbage. And I was like, that's a gem. If I've ever seen a mid-century chair, that's a gem. It's this one. I took it, then I had it reupholstered, and then I put it in my bedroom to be the chair that collects my clothes. The ones that you're like, it's not dirty enough, Mm -hmm. but it's also not clean. I do. You have one of those chairs too? Everyone does. You're not living your best life. Mine's a couch. Right. (laughs) So anyway, I brought that chair down here. And now the chair that was here, which was my kitchen chair, doesn't really fit at the kitchen table because we still have like a high chair seat. And it's down here. It's way too short for this desk. So I put some pillows under my bum. But this is the exciting part. I was at Aldi. Do you ever shop at Aldi? Love it. Love Mm -hmm. Aldi. Okay. And for $35, there was an ottoman with storage in it. I was very skeptical because it was like a very small box. (laughs) I was like, I'm not sure how that's going to be an ottoman unless it's for a doll. But I bought it. And now my feet are resting on it and I'm more comfortable and wow, I could put stuff in it. What an update. (laughs) (laughs) I'm really happy. So my chair was 110 bucks from Staples. Great. I'm sitting on a (laughs) stool (laughs) at my my kitchen island. (laughs) Yeah. Most of my career before I went out on my own was in-house, right? So everybody had to have the matching color-coded right. Herman Miller chair. I love Herman Miller. I love their products, but whichever products they chose that office just messed my back up so insanely. Oh, no. I mean, these were like expensive Sue. chairs, right? But I'm just sitting, so I'm just sitting there during, you know, but everybody's got them, right? So when I left, I'm like, I got to find me a chair. I got to find me a chair. And I just happened to be in Staples and I found this chair. It's was amazing. Like a brand, like I've never even heard of before. And I got like, yeah. I think this is like my third one. I had one in my studio in Atlanta hmm. and then I had one here and then I've used the heck out of it and just, and just got one to replace it. And it's been yes. fantastic. Sometimes it's is just the an humble ad for, solutions. Is that yeah. an ad for the ticket. Hmm? Yeah. Oh no. This whole, no, every, no, no. Everything we do is sponsored by Staples. <laughs> Well, I love that for you. We you also tell us whose bum is in the chair? Do a little intro of who you yeah. are and oh. maybe tell us about what you do. What, as which segues bum is yours? Go, as segues go, <laughs> uh, I lay claim to both cheeks. So my name is Scott Fuller. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. I run the studio Temporary. We do everything from brand identity and illustration to type design and packaging, environmental, all kind of fun stuff. Stay the heck away from web and UI UX. I'm Amen. sorry. Ooh, y'all, Amen. y'all can, yeah, y'all can have it. We can toss our hats it. in that too. No, I don't want it. Don't give it to oh, me. No. Yeah. Somebody else <laughs> can take it. Yeah. No, thank yes. you. Back in the day when um, I did WordPress websites, that was awful. I mean, they're great. I just don't want to do it's, them. Agreed. But at the same time, I don't know. But that's pretty much it. I've been running the professional since about 2008 when I graduated from college. And then actually, I just celebrated nine years running the studio full time. Amazing. I got congratulations. A, yeah, that's a long time. I got a notification from LinkedIn that said I have been on LinkedIn for 14 years. And I was like, wow, don't know what significance that has to me. But thank you. <laughs> it makes you a little bit old. You think <laughs> It does, you know, true, just you a know. little bit. Yeah. None of us look like it. I'm just going to yeah. say, you know, we're none young. of us look like whatever our age is, you know? Yeah, yeah. we're fresh, thing, little you know? daisies. You don't, you don't even <laughs> I know. got I'm carded and the other day. I got carded. <laughs> did you really? You're going to get carded for like the next five years. You know, <laughs> my you. wife, we've been married last December. We celebrated 15 years. We've been wow. married. Wow. And what is that? Big milestones. She's half Japanese, right? She still looks like she's 22. Mm. It's unbelievable. I mean, if you look at our wedding photos and her right now, it's Mm. insane. What a lucky lass she is. I did. I did run into (laughs) someone from high school this morning. There was like a parade at my kid's school. And she was like, you do look the same as you did in eighth grade. And I was like, I think I do. I mean, I look older, but I do pretty much nothing has changed. I do also. 
Yeah, it's interesting. My shoe size is the same. My pant size is the mm-hmm. same. I mean, yeah, I'm totally I'm a larger now, but <laughs> physically, yeah, no, I'm like, I literally yeah, I, I look can identical. wear my clothes. It's weird. Anyway, this is well, a tangent. But that's that's what happens. amazing. <laughs> that must be <laughs> okay, really this is, nice. <laughs> this is a tangent that it's dumb, but I'm gonna ask it anyway because that's it. what we do here. Is we're just here. Great to have preface. A good time. <laughs> Thanks. Love it. I want everyone to know what they're getting into, and that's 45 <laughs> minutes of crap. How small is the Fuller world? Like, do you meet a lot of Fullers? <laughs> Are you talking about my extended family or my current family? Way extended. Just Whoa. as in okay. the last um, name in general? Yeah, like, is it a common uh, last name? I don't know how, I mean, it's so funny. One of my clients' last name is actually Fuller right now, which is kind of funny, but I don't meet a lot of Fullers. Okay. I'm not going to lie. But either that or they all stay in Alabama, which is where like 90% mm. of my family is. I mean, every everywhere in Alabama, every like Prattville, Montgomery, Birmingham, Mobile, up there. Oh, you got Scottsboro, the whole state covered. And, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we go. got it all covered. We got it all covered. And then locally, my mom and dad live in the house that I grew up in still in, oh, in Sharpsburg, which is uh, about southeast of the southeast of the airport. So uh, there's a couple mom. of you. Yeah. Then I've got my wife, Julie, lovely wife, Julie, my 12 year old son, Sean, our eight week old daughter, Mia. Oh my Yay. God. Just I saw had the a little picture. baby. Oh, Isn't she uh, gorgeous? On your Instagram. She's oh my God. Isn't she gorgeous? My goodness. She's so, just we a little so gal. Excited. She is. She was three weeks early too. Oh, oh um, wow. And she has just grown and everything's developed in her own oh. little personality. My favorite part, her hair is the same color as my beard. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> whoop, whoop, whoop. Love we, it. We, uh, love, we love a little bit of a ginger and there's not enough of them in the world. I have a cat, Ella. Great. Okay. Oh, love that. Love really cat. extended yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, well does, not, she, does she take the fuller name as well? She does. Oh, no. Great. Some of oh, our pets are fuller. in my husband's last name and some are in mine because we didn't exchange last names. <laughs> I love it. Sure I said that as if we yeah. just like switched them. <laughs> I like that as a new tradition. Let's just switch. <laughs> well, this totally went way farther than it needed to. But the reason I was asking is because on a recent episode, I think we were talking to one of our guests lived in New Zealand and I have an ex from when I was 16, maybe 14. Real serious 14. relationship. <laughs> And he was a fuller and he's dead to me. So I just wanted to put oh, that out wow. there in case he just was Just wanted to make cousin. sure. Because <laughs> if he is related to you, interview so over. So that's who he was talking about. Yeah, the, when we oh, were 14. Deep in love. That makes perfect sense Deep now. in love. Okay. Yeah. I'll text Listen, him later. I am married to my high school sweetheart, which is like, oh, cute. Yeah, yeah. But it's like, if you do the math, I must have been 14. So obviously it was really not a big deal. But it just clicked for me. Anyway, let's Should talk we talk more design, about do you think? Design. I think, yeah, I think that's maybe enough let's, of, yeah. <laughs> my, enough jibber jabbing. <laughs> you think? Is there ever enough? Anyway, okay. The thing that I noticed about your work is that you are incredibly prolific when it comes to branding. So I wanted to like take a step back and maybe talk about how you found your footing in branding. Was Mm -hmm. it you always were drawn to it? Did you study it in school? And kind of the trajectory of really finding your footing there. That's a heck of a story. So I grew up, I graduated from high school at 16. I went straight to college. My dad was, uh, what is it? I'm sorry. We're like two seconds into it. I'm just like, how did you do that? <laughs> private Accelerated. School, they work, cl- private oh, school, they okay. let me work ahead. Got it. Okay, uh, continue. Uh, I just was yeah. baffled. <laughs> so my mom was a teacher. My mom was an elementary school teacher. My dad's a machinist, has been for 40 something years. So I had a chance to work with him in high school and, and even before high school, I'm nine, 10 years old, working in his shop, doing different stuff. And I always had a head for numbers and I love building things too. So in high school, I did trig, physics, calculus, the whole thing. I had a scholarship for mechanical engineering. Like I was ready to go, but I always drew. I always drew ever since I was a kid. The mechanical, the stuff always really kind of hit home with me. So I decided that even though I was getting the scholarship for that to change my major to actually studio art. So I started in like pen and pencil, oil painting, everything like that when I went to school. So a year and a half in, I'm good at it, but I hate it. I just can't stand it because I'll put this out there for any other artists. This is just my take on it. I was tired of looking at something that already existed and just drawing it or painting it or doing something like that. In my mind, I never felt like I was actually creating or building anything new. So I was about two mouse clicks away from just throwing it all away and going and doing mechanical engineering. I was, I'm not kidding. I had already filled out all the forms and everything. 
I decided to give it one more semester. And the first class was graphic design. I was in the class for 10 minutes and I said, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I immediately went down, changed my major to graphic design and just jumped straight in. My first project was a logo, was three logos. And I fell in love, just absolutely fell in love. I enjoyed the packaging. I enjoyed the posters. I enjoyed all these different things, but there's something about crafting a mark and building a brand around that, that I think is, it's very difficult to do at times, especially if for me, my first mentor was Steph Geisbuehler, the guy who did like the NBC logo and stuff like that. I met him at my first ever design conference in 2007 it was the How Conference in Atlanta, which was just like a massive, just, I didn't even know that 90% of this stuff even existed. And I heard his talk on timelessness and simplicity. And the first book that I ever bought, actually, I think I still have it yep, right here. First book I ever got was the Shermath and Geismar trademark book. I bought this brand new back in 2007, and it's never been any further away than an arm's length. It's when I graduated, that was the era of sustainability. That was the big keyword, right? 2007 to about 2011, all everybody could talk about was green and sustainability and everything. And everything was light and lean and leafy and green and organic. I just couldn't stand it. So I wanted to build something. I think the machinist background helps. I wanted to build things that were going to last. My goal when I design something is it never, ever has to be redesigned. And that goes for anything, everything from illustrations to eye concepts to the branding itself. That's my ultimate goal. It just fascinated me. Books upon books upon books of people that have long since passed away. And that's where I learned. That's where I learned my craft from. One of my teachers in school always told me, you know, if you master the basic shapes, you can do pretty much anything you want. So that was my goal. Master the basic shapes and then just build off everything from there. I tend to have long answers. So <laughs> there no, is that. But that's, that's what really got me into it, though. Yeah, I see a lot of that geometry and structure in your work too. And it's so interesting that you kind of came from that mechanical, technical, mathy background because yeah, there's so much like structure to the work where I can find that through line. We're in the process of writing a book about finding your style and kind of like identifying all these parts of your personality that then feed into who you are as an artist. And so I'm extra like tuned into that stuff right now. Yeah. <laughs> but it, yeah, did you find that that kind of influenced your design aesthetic as well? Just me personally or whatever? Yeah, like your kind of technical background, the way that you approach oh, a problem. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's a big help too, because I think that for me, I see a lot of people and I was, you know, I did this too. When I first started is looking at logos, you almost build them from the outside in. I build them from the inside out, right? And that changed in 2011. I can literally point to a date and time when that all changed. There's a designer, he passed away in 2016, probably the biggest influence on my career outside of Lance Wyman, probably the biggest influence on my career. And I call him the most famous designer that no one's ever heard of. And his name's Malcolm Greer. Malcolm Greer, he taught at RISD for 50 years. He's the guy who designed the Presbyterian Church logo. I mean, this guy is symbolism, his negative space, his everything is just on an entirely different level. I came across an old, oh, who was it? Armin, Armin from Under Consideration. Um, yeah, fit. Yeah, I love Armin, Bryony, everybody. Yeah, I love them so much. So Armin emailed me, this was back in 2011, emailed me and he said, I came across this thing, I think you would enjoy it. And it was an eight minute Vimeo about Malcolm Greer and his studio. And it just blew my mind. I went out and found his book. What is it? Inside Outside. That was the name of his book. This is when Instagram was brand new, right? So I found the book online for like 10 bucks. I still haven't been able to find it that much anymore. Go in there. I look through it. I'm blown away. I take a picture. I put it on Instagram. About half an hour later, I get a call and it's his son from Rhode Island who's there in his studio. And he wants to know, he's like, how in the world do you find that book? It's like he wrote it and we can't even find any more of it, <laughs> right? So I got to talk to him for about 20 minutes and I said, look, would I be able to just say hey to Malcolm? I said, I know he's busy. And he's like, yeah, it's busy. you know." Doing, and I said, I understand. I said, if I send in the book, would he be able to sign it for me? And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Send it up here. We'll do that. Tip for any of y'all out there. If you want your favorite artist, designer, creator, whatever, to sign your book and you have to mail it to him, send it to him, send them money for postage or return postage with the book. Do not make them pay. I'm telling you right now, that will piss them off to no end. Yeah, I would just so, keep it. <laughs> exactly. How am I supposed so to give this I, back to you? 
<laughs> so I got the book right here and he came from an industrial design background too. So maybe that's why we kind of, oh, we kind clicked. of hit on it. So I also sent along, you know, a little bit of my work and threw it in the book just to kind of see what would come of it. And about two weeks later, I got it back and all my work was still in there. <laughs> so I was like, okay, smack, that's fine. So we signed the book. And then in the middle of the book, I got a handwritten note from him. Isn't that the best handwriting? Like just fantastic, right? That is. So it's also said, large uh, and in charge. I like it. He takes I up the space. <laughs> he said, Dear Scott, thanks for the compliments. I'm happy to sign the book, Malcolm Greer. And then P.S. Look heavy at form and counterform. Because what I'd sent it before, once again, I was building everything from the outside in. So my outside and my parameters looked really good, but the inside, there wasn't really anything happening. So I immediately switched and I could literally point to that day in my career when everything changed all from that note. That's so cool. Can you expand a little bit on what you mean when you're talking about form and counterform and this like revelation for you? So basically this idea that if you look at a building, you look at a car, you look at all these different things. Yes, there's the body and everything like that, but the innards have to be right too. You have to make sure that that's right and it supports it. You have to make sure that the inside and the structure supports the overall build of the logo, right? So if you do all this work on the outside and whatnot, like let's say it's a flower, right? All these petals looking really nice, but you can't quite get the inside just right, or it doesn't match. Even if the outside is this beautiful thing, people are going to look at that dead center and see like something's not quite right. So what I love to do is I build from the inside out, right? I focus on the negative space. I focus on that and making sure that everything kind of aligns and has the same look and feel. It's not a new way of thinking, I'm sure. I'm positive. <laughs> but for me, it was a big change. And that kind of furthered my whole thought process into, I have a very personalized style. So I must have an in-person conversation or a Zoom conversation with a client at a start of a project. If they don't do it, I don't take the project. I refuse because there's something, every single piece that I've ever done has a personal aspect to it. No matter if it's for Coke, you know, Coca-Cola and one of their big in, inside programs to the mom and pop shop around the street, they're around the corner. Always, always, always a personal aspect to it. And I try to bring that out in the brand and in the logo itself. I feel like it's really rare or more rare than maybe it should be for someone to be so clear on that through line and that like core of why they do what they do. I think it's mm -hmm. actually really challenging for a lot of people because I think some people just sort of fall into it. And a lot of people have a harder time knowing so early on what they want to do with their life. And mm -hmm. so I think that does really come through in your work because I tried to look back as far as I could, like on your Instagram. And oh boy, you found some good ones on there. I, I didn't, you know, I don't know that I went far enough back because it all felt really cohesive and the through line seemed really clear. I guess I'm curious what advice you would give to someone who is like, yeah, I like design, but I like doing branding. I like doing greeting cards. I like making prints. I like doing this. And they don't really feel like they couldn't give an elevator pitch like you just gave that expresses why they do what they do. They're just like, I like it. How would you help them get to where? Here's the, th they here's the thing. Be? One thing that I've seen a lot too is one of the things that I've been able to do, blessed to do throughout my career, is to be able to work with other creatives and building their brand to help them build their own brand. So agencies, creatives, photographers, artists, designers, everything. We have the hardest time a lot of times building our own brand. I mean, even with y'all, like I know that y'all were heavily involved, but going and working with the, and working with Amy and Jen, doing some amazing stuff for Good Type. I mean, just phenomenal all the way through. And there was each one of y'all's touches on there as well. But it's a difficult thing to do. My thought on this is, I think with me, I'm less focusing on a style. A style may come through. A personality might come through. That's fine. I don't care about that. I'm focused on the end goal. And the end goal is to design work that is iconic, work that's, that's timeless, work that's simple and memorable. And that can take any form, any style. So focus less on this is who I am, like as a style, as this. It's like, who are you as a person? Because that'll tell me more about your style than you sitting here saying, oh, I enjoy classic forms of this and that, or however that is. I want to know about you because you are the ones that influences your style, influences all this other stuff. So focus less on the style and more about you as a person. And I think you'll have a lot easier time figuring that out. Yeah, I think it's interesting because sometimes the stuff that 
we find in our personality just like innately finds a place aesthetically. And we're doing the work right now in our book of trying to sort of really dig into how those things translate and how they influence each other. But like, for example, I'm really drawn to details and ornamentation and just the more there is to feast your eyes on, the happier I am and the more I'm like Mm -hmm. drawn into a work. And I think that as I've done this reflection about myself, it's just innately coming out that way because I really appreciate in people and in my relationships when people are really focused on the details or when they go above Mm -hmm. and beyond and show their care and concern in that way. And there's just like Mm -hmm. so many of these little things that I'm noticing. But yeah, I mean, it's sometimes you don't need to be digging around for the exact intent and it just Mm -hmm. shows up. (laughs) And then later you find that connection. Because like what I'm hearing with you. Because like what I'm hearing with you, it's like, yes, you started out saying ornamentation and a lot to work with. But what it sounded like you were really saying when we got down to the end was you're just looking for the little details that show people actually care. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. Right. So Maybe it's next. less. So it's it's not necessarily. <laughs> this is how I work. Right. I'm literally like I'm designing a logo for each one of you. No. Um, yeah. <laughs> Go but for it. That would be give me one, cool. please. Yeah. <laughs> right. But this is we can talk. That'll be that'll be. It. We'll talk about this after. So we're talking about me right now, okay? So just, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But this is how, this is how I work. This is how I work. You can't do this through email. I'm going to shout it out to the people in the back row. You cannot do this through email, through Slack. I freaking hate Slack. I hate it. I can't stand it. No good. I don't like it. It's just, no, this conversation back and forth, like we talked about this for two minutes. This would take 30 emails to get to this point. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, but this is how I work. This is what I'm trying to do. This idea of you are telling me this and I'm hearing this overall, right? You love a lot of things, but what you really love is the attention to detail. Mm-hmm. And that's almost, it's almost like a love language, right? It's like, yeah. I know when somebody gives me that attention to detail, right? So that's how I approach branding. That's why this doesn't get old for me. There's a lot of folks that's like, I did logos for a long, long time. I'm just tired of it. Now I'm going to go be a creative director. I'm going to go try this or I'm going to go do that. This is why I don't get tired of this stuff because everyone is different. Everyone is unique and everyone has the potential to be this iconic thing. And it's my job to try to bring that out. And this is how I do that face to face. I want to share the difference between me and Katie. But before I do that, <laughs> I think it's really interesting because so many people I think have gone towards the like, let's go digital. We don't even need to have a meeting about this. And that human connection is truly at the core of what we do yeah. when you are it trying has to, to tell someone's story. Like branding is storytelling. And everyone is like, I'm a visual storyteller. If you're a storyteller, then you are going to give your client the time to hear their story. Yes. And I just... And the client has it. to give me their time as well. Right. I see you people know? wanting to get away from that. And it's really refreshing to hear you be like, we yeah. can't. We can't skip that part. I'm an old think, soul. Well, yeah. I'm an old soul. The... I'm, I'm, the, I'm, the get off, I'm the get off the lawn type of guy. I just turned 38. But one of my best friends has been in the industry longer than I've been, almost as long as I've been alive. Right. And he and I are literally the same person, 28, 30 years apart. I learned from kind of the old masters and I kind of took on some of that thought process and brought it into myself and turned it out as my own type of way of seeing that. So I think it showed a lot of people that it's like, yes, maybe you don't have to be in the office next to each other five days a week, 10 hours, 12 hours a day or whatever. But it's at the same time, it did show that there is this absolute need for that connection. And I think people are really starting to see that now. And they're trying to get it through Zoom. They're trying to get it through the Slack and everything like that. And it's like that. Nah, I want to shake your hand. Like, I'm going to see you guys. I'm going to see you guys next month in Austin. I'm going to yes, see you all next month. And so I'm so great. excited to meet y'all. I'll give a hug and say, hey, and you'll have to come by my vendor booth. It's where you have an awesome big type. I've got hoodies and t-shirts and all kind of fun stuff. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. And we'll talk more about that in a second because I definitely want to. But that human connection is is a big part. I have a question for the folks who I think have fear as a basis of why they are intimidated to talk with clients and why they're like, oh, can I please do this via email? Can I be behind my keyboard? 
I remember as a young designer, like very young, when I just was working with my first couple of clients and I had to sit down with them and lead the conversation and be in charge for the first time. And they were looking to me as the expert. I was freaking terrified and I was mm -hmm. so uncomfortable and I was like shaking. <laughs> yeah. Now it's like I'm a totally different person because I've done it so many times. But I wonder what advice you'd give to those people who are wanting to have these conversations, but having a difficult time getting to that place where they feel confident and they can own that. You got to be uncomfortable before you can be comfortable. I mean, Classic. that's really all there is to it. I mean, I talked about that so much. I actually teach at formerly Portfolio Center, but now Miami Ad School here in Atlanta. I teach uh, symbol and logo design. I have, um, this is my fourth time teaching with them now. And one of the things that I tell them, you're not going to be sending me this, this, and this. Like you have to give me an actual presentation because yeah, that's important. there's a human connection to this. There's a human connection with that design. And I think some of that humanity in the design has been lost a little bit. You hear everybody talking about AI. You hear everybody talking about this and that, or, oh, I can just grab this over here quick as a placeholder and just do that. Or I have this person who can do that. So. People can read and read emails, read blog posts, read the about you on your site. But at some point, you have to have a conversation with them. They have to get to know you as a person to really know how well you can work together. I've already landed a couple of clients this year. They were looking at multiple designers. And one of the reasons they picked me, other than the fact that I do good work, is the fact that they instantly had a connection with me. That was what put me over the top. So you'll find if you need some kick in the pants or something like that to really move you in that direction, I have gained more clients because I can have these conversations with people and be comfortable than not. Yeah. That has gotten me a pretty good amount of work, but I wasn't always good at it. I think it's interesting so, because interpersonal skills is just as important, if not sometimes more important as a designer. And it is just not yep. something that's taught very often. I'm really glad to hear that you incorporate like asking your students to do presentations and things like that. Mm -hmm. But we had very minimal practice in kind of a client designer relationship when I was in school. And then the people who don't go to school, like you're kind of required to just innately know how to do that. That can be really tricky. Things, Alana's really good at it just naturally. <laughs> so she's one of the things that I do my golden in my gal. class. Aww. One of the things that I do in class is I have this book. It's this most it's the most amazing book, probably one of my most favorite design books that I have. And it's not technically a design book. It's just the 1979 U.S. Trademark Registry. And it has, every, it's the size of an encyclopedia, but it has every registered logo in the U.S. for the year 1979. All wow, the good. That's cool. And it's everything from TV shows that's to awesome. packaging. What to, a time capsule. It's insane. And unlike design books, it's not curated. Yeah. It, there's some. <laughs> the good, the bad, bad and the ugly. <laughs> there are some horrific ones in here that are just so insanely funny. But the other stuff, does. So what I do with clients. One of the things that I do, like a quick segue, when I give a talk at a conference or something like that, I don't do notes, I don't do outlines, and I don't practice before I go on. I do the whole, I do the, everything as close to off the top of my head. So like Bold. if you, like your conference coming up, right? If you had me in, I would have my deck, right? And whatnot. And then I would know what was in my deck. And then I would get up there and I would give it for the first time because it's my life, right? Mm -hmm. It's what I've been yeah. doing. So I should be able to talk about it. And I have a basic idea of what's coming, right? But I give it for the first time because I don't want it to sound practice. I don't want it to sound unique or anything, you know, like this very done and done type of thing. So what I'll do with we my We are different my humans, client. sir. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> so that's what I'll do that scares the crap out of second. me. Yeah. We have a quick segue. Katie and I did our presentation at a conference a couple years ago at this point. And we tried to like put some improvising moments that like we were like, oh, this will be funny here. And we threw candy out into the crowd. And I hit someone smack in the face and that was the start of our talk. And I will never be throwing candy out again. <laughs> See, that's different because so I actually, I got a chance to design a mural thing, especially a Christmas thing for our city here and where I live just outside of Woodstock. And part of that is I got to ride on like a, they say ride on a float, but it was basically ride in the back of a truck with like my logo on it or whatever in like the Christmas parade. And they gave me like candy to throw out. And I was like trying to hit people. You know oh. what I mean? I was well, like, well, we do I'm take different approaches. <laughs> right. So You're like, score 10 I'm, points. So what I'll do is with my students, when I give them projects, 
I don't give them like, go redesign the Sunoco logo or the Coca-Cola logo or something. I'll make it up. So what I'll do is I'll turn to one page in here and pick out like a name. And then I'll turn to another page and pick out an industry and then make up a name and make up the brand like on the spot right there. And that way they have to write that down. And it's almost like a character I get in. Right. So it's like, you know, it's, it's design improv. I mean, we don't know what we're getting, you know, it's not like we're getting a book with everything laid out for us, you know, in the real world. We're not. No, we have to do the stuff that we've never heard of before. Right. I was in-house design for my entire career before I went out on my own. So I knew who I was working for. I knew who my clients were. I knew what my industry was. I knew who my customers were. So I had to design like that. But I said, when I got out, I wanted to do everything. And now I've, like I said, everything from Coca-Cola to the Braves to working on energy drinks to working with Killer Mike and TI. It's just to designing stuff from my barber shop. It's all over the place. And I love that variety. So I want to try to give them that same variety as well. How do you price your work when you are working with such a range of clients, big or small? Like that's a huge I, variety you just shared. Like your barber shop might not have the same budget as a house name no. brand. So house name, what is that word I'm thinking of? House name? Oh, like, yeah. Uh, like what is name? It, um, people, regular people in a house know it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. How would you um, price? household name? Household name. Household name. Household oh, name. okay. Household it name. sounded right to me, but you're yeah, right. It didn't. You were, it didn't right feel like a house name on my tongue. Um, so you look at basically it's value based. You have one company that's valued at this. You have a mom and pop shop that's valued at this, right? So you look at three thousand dollars for one client might be like wow, I thought we were going to pay a thousand. It's like, I think we can do three. They just tripled their budget for you. That's a big deal. And then you go to another company and you say like, oh, here's this, this will cost you $16,000 or something. And some folks don't bat an eyelash. It's so the it's proportional you, value. It's proportional value. So it's a work in progress. It'll always be a work in progress, but it's something that I've gotten better at over the years. It helps too. I do have a rep now, which is a lot of fun. They do a lot of help out with that and it'll be announced to the world soon, but I am one of the newest members of Coloop, part of their client roster or their artist roster. So Yay, I'm really Co-Loop. thrilled about that. Ryan and I have worked together, talking back and forth for like the last couple of years and then worked on multiple projects uh, up until last year, including one with Monotype. And they started talking about their new type software and everything like that. So I got to, I took three typefaces and designed an entire pizza brand, including the icons using only pieces of type. So oh, cool. that was, yeah, like the whole thing is all just built out of pieces of type. And it's one of the things that I'm kind of known for, but it's something that I really enjoy doing. So there's a lot of help there. So learning and doing from different folks. And every now and then, depending on, hey, this might be nice, like we're getting ready to go on vacation. Here's a little extra money or something like that. If I can help them out, then I will. I'll help anybody out as much as I can. The one thing that I have, a, I used to be really bad about this when I first got out and I just took every project is a timeline. I'll help you out, but I need a little time. If you need something like, hey, I need this in like three days, a week or something like that. It's like, look, I'd like to help, but I can't put all this other stuff aside for that. So you're going to have to either give me some time or give me some more money. I don't Um, know where that expectation came from that people, we had this over the weekend, like people expect us to literally be monitoring our inbox or our DMs at all hours of the day. Like we are actually humans. Here's the thing. You pay me, you pay me to do that. Then, Mm -hmm. Hey, like I was in, uh, what was it last month? I had to go out of town over the weekend. And then I was speaking at Auburn university on Monday. I got a project on Thursday that needed to be done by Tuesday morning. And I told them, this is what's happening. This is where I won't be available. And if you want it done by then, here's the normal price. Here's what it costs if you want it done by then. And it was basically triple. Mm -hmm. And I said, if you need it done by then, this is what it's got to be. And they're like, it was a pretty decent size. And it's like, if you can knock like a K or 2K off of that, then we're fine. And I'm already getting two and a half, what I would, two and a half times what I would normally get. And then they were like everything up front. And I got it done. It's been going around for forever. It's like a client that pays you. Okay. Well, I thought not that's just, where not you're just that, go with but it. like a client that pays you a thousand dollars or something, or like five hundred dollars. Like, oh, here's this money, and we're gonna go on this big like journey of discovery and like whatever, whatnot. And then you have the client that pays you like twenty, thirty thousand dollars, and oh, they're like, yeah. "Here's your money." Well, it's the difference you know? in what the money like, means to them. I think the smaller exactly. clients or like people who don't have the budgets, every dollar is really mm-hmm. intentionally hard earned. They're aware of where it's going. Bigger companies are just like, right. And bigger companies are just like, oh, Frank, can you handle this for me? Make it happen. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. And that's the thing. Like that's where the value based comes in. Yeah. You know? and it's fun. And then there's other things you can do too. Like I have some of these people that come to me have services that I might need or, or whatnot. So if it's like, Hey, I can only give you mm -hmm. X amount. I'm not above bartering. I'm currently yeah. in what is it? I have two clients right now that there's a barter in progress with some of the stuff that's going to help me out a lot. It's not something that I do as often as I did when I first got started, but if it's there and I can use it, then I'll absolutely do that. It's like, yeah. it's making it worth my while to do that. I have a 12 year old son, he's sixth grade now, red belt in Taekwondo, right? I've got a brand new baby. I've got a wonderful wife. If you want to pay me to do different things, like how I, I would, if I didn't have to worry about money or anything like that, like I'd go talk wherever, like, Hey, AIGA wants you to come and do this talk. It's like, okay, what's your speaker fee? Well, there's no speaker fee. Okay. Then I can't come. I want to go. I want to talk, but if I'm going to be away for a couple of days, I have to be compensated for all these different things and it has to be worth my while. Well, I think it's important to touch on the things other than money that you can negotiate on that you've mentioned, like timeline, bartering, reducing the scope of the project. Like there's, I think breaking that's, it up, breaking yeah, it up into exactly. different phases. It's yeah, like, if you want, I know it's like, I know you need all these things, but I do my half down half at the end. Right. So why don't we break instead of one big thing that costs this, let's make it three smaller things. And then we can parse out those payments that way. And then that usually takes care of it. Yeah, I think that's like the number one pricing mistake we see is that people think, oh, if you're at this number and I'm at this number, we're done talking. And if we can't meet, that's the end of the conversation. So yeah, it's we can get more creative with the ways that we can meet in the middle somewhere. Yeah. And then the fun part is like you get to even after all that or like your warm up in the morning or like, hey, I'm night crewing it or whatnot. You get to make stuff for yourself. And I get to segue once. So I have done merch for the studio and everything for years. The last stuff I made was like three, four years ago. I think three years ago, I did like a little poster, which actually is the one like right behind me over here. But I was like, I'm ready to make some studio merch and do some stuff like that. But I didn't want to just put studio temporary on it. It sells, which is fine, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to build something. I have a new streetwear brand and it is called Iconic and it is debuting at Crop, which I'm very, Amazing. very excited about. Actually, that monotype project that I did with Kolu, I remember I did like an inch. Oh, no, it was right before that. I did just a check in on a Monday, like a reel. I rarely do reels, right? I need to do more. But I just did a thing. It's like happy Monday. Here's what we are going on. Hope everybody's doing well. Make sure you do this, 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 you know, get water, get to what, you know, whatever. And then at the end, I just hit in my typeface, I just went stay iconic and then flash to my logo and it just stuck. I kept doing it and I kept sticking with it. So when I sat down to figure out what am I going to call this thing that iconic and I did everything, man, I built out a custom typeface for it. I've got posters, I've got illustrations, I've got all kind of stuff. I've already got some collaborations that I'm talking about. So, and I haven't even put any, I haven't even shown any of the merch yet. So I'm really excited about that. One of the things that I always loved, you know, about working for myself or even just on the side is making your own stuff and not just slapping your logo on a web. There's nothing wrong with that. But I wanted to make something that I could really just do something crazy. with, And I think this gives me that opportunity. That's really fun. Congrats. Yeah, that's exciting. I'm excited. I'm very excited. I want to. I do have to in. say one last, yeah. one last thing. One last thing. Yeah. I've been featured on Good Type on the Instagram and everything like that a lot. But I do owe something big to y'all. And this is in the still in the Brook days. So this would have been back in like 2015. But just Good Type in general. I did my first typeface with Dustin Lee from Retro Supply. It's called Solid 70, right? And I got, since I'm an old school guy, like 90% of the work that I do is going to be on a physical product in some way, shape or form, right? Of course, I did a specimen poster and it was yellow, beautiful French yellow paper rest in peace, French, and this beautiful green, like an old MacMaster car catalog, right? And I actually went, I messaged Brooke and I was like, look, I'd love to do like a giveaway. Let's do like, I'll put the poster up, grand prize gets the typeface and the poster. And then like, whoever I pick randomly gets that. And then like 10 other random people will get like the typeface or something like that. And she put it up. And I think I, in a space of about eight hours, I think I got about a thousand new followers. And that was like my first year out on business for myself. And that brought me a lot of like ignition and people started talking and inquiring and stuff like that. So some of the success that I had early on, some of the stuff that kind of got us through, I owe it to Good Type. So I wanted to at least put that out there. Oh, and, shout uh, out to OG get, Good Type and Bodie. Yeah, that's awesome. 
That's uh, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. I wanted to quickly do a like rapid fire round because Let's do it. I really wanted to start the podcast with this, but then I got on my chair <laughs> tangent. Um, <laughs> I'm curious if there's any design trends that you really, they, you just ick, they give you the ick. Mm. Gotta be something. So many. Uh... <laughs> They're so blurted out. No yeah. need to. I, I don't know. That, I don't know that I can necessarily pick one thing as okay. a general. A yeah. As a general idea, like if it's a fad or a trend or whatever, I don't touch it with a 10 foot pole. So like I'm actively aware of some of this stuff, but I just don't, man, y'all really did put me on this. Y'all really did put me on the spot with that one. Oh my gosh. That's okay. We can move on to another one. You just hate all of them. Basically. If it's a fad or trend or different thing, I try to stay away from it as yeah. much as possible. I mean, when yeah. I grew when I was coming up, it was the crossed arrows and the leafy organic everything. And then I don't know. I get it. <sighs> Yeah, yeah. You're not, you don't like you, the trends. If it's a trend, you don't like it. You're not here for it. What about how do you like your pizza since you talked about the pizza ooh, project with Monotype? I love, uh, I do gluten-free cauliflower crust. <laughs> I like it with a lot. Of, well, I've been that way for a minute, so. Uh, I'm also gluten-free, but man, cauliflower, we need to step up our game. I hate when people try and make cauliflower a thing. I'm like, yeah. Get I out of here. I don't like cauliflower rice. I just don't like cauliflower it's rice, but I will either. I will do that on the pizza if it's done okay. right. All right. Um, yeah. I like a lot of cheese. I don't like a lot of sauce. Okay. Just enough to for me to know it's there. I don't like a lot of sauce, cheese, and a lot of meat, like bacon, pepperoni, sausage, ham, Canadian bacon, whatever. I love mm. that. Or a meat pie. chicken and like spicy. Yeah. Pie. Or something meat that pie. has like a little bit of chicken on there with like some peppers and spinach mm. and stuff like that. It's just so, so, so good. Awesome. Love it. Okay. He's and then- passionate about his pizza. I can hear it. <laughs> the last one. What are two just things in your life that you've been loving right now? They don't have to be design related. It could be right. like a new hat you got. It looks like you're a hat guy. From the just a little bit. Ninja. I mean, obviously my daughter. I mean, she's eight weeks yeah, old. Yeah, well, um, you better, she that, better be number one that. on the list. Yeah, just my family in general. I mean, we've gone mm. through a lot over the course That's of sweet. our marriage and just back and forth. It's been nuts, but I feel like this whole like work life balance thing is something that I'm probably never going to be great at, but I'm always going to continue trying to be. I feel like we're in a much better position there, and I'm really happy about that. I'm loving my time with my family, just really, really, truly enjoying that. Greg's going to go do, do a little something after I'm done with this. On the outside, I mean, what is it? Yeah, new hats. Anytime <laughs> messing around with that. My most recent guy right up here. It's what I kind of feel like this a little bit at times, but <laughs> got that. If you see, he's actually missing his arm, but he's carrying it in his bag, which is really Perfect. cool. It's just kind of like, I saw that and I just went nuts. But the other thing is I used to play table tennis on a national level. Oh my and I still gosh. Play. I still play. I still, I still play. I still compete. That's fun. Play league and whatnot and still train. So something that I'm very passionate about, something that I've always enjoyed Amazing. Ever, ever since I picked it up. Well, on That's that great. note, we've got to wrap up. Alas, where can the people <laughs> find you? We'll drop it in the show notes for them. What do you want them to know? Go to thestudiotemporary.com. Got our new website in the works, as every other designer in the world does. And if you want to see the most up-to-date, follow me on Instagram, at Studio Temporary. On Twitter, also at Studio Temporary. Basically, anywhere at Studio Temporary. I'll see you guys around the conference circuit. I'll see you wherever I see you. Thanks again yeah. to Good Type. I, I think Aww. y'all y'all been a big help to uh, an entire generation of designers. Yeah. Definitely been a big help to me. And the fact that y'all allow me to come on and just talk about my BS for a little <laughs> while. It's Love not it. something, this is the type of stuff that I don't take this industry for granted. I definitely don't take this type of stuff for granted. So I just wanted to say thank y'all so much. Well, thank you for shooting the BS breeze with us. <laughs> BS breeze. All right, we'll catch you on the, the next episode. Thanks for coming on. All good things.